Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to the disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. To the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. This special ended up as a result of a couple of things. A pa an invitation from the pastor to do a special, and a night when I just could not go to sleep because this one song 
was going through my head over and over and over. And eventually I added a second one. The first one is Jesus loves me, everyone knows that one. The second one may not be quite as familiar, is oh how I love Jesus. And it's in the Faith We Sing book, if you would like to look at the words, I am amazed how this all came together because the theme seems to be loving Jesus uh, t this morning. And the words are very appropriate. It's in the Faith We Sing, number one, or 2108. If you want to follow along, you'll know when we get to that song. Mm -hmm. Please join me in Psalm 30 on page 762 in your hymnal. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cry to you for help, and you heal me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. Restore me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Restore me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Surely the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. 
By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What a prophet is there in my death, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have lo lo loosened my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Psalm holy gospel of our lord jesus christ according to saint john glory to you lord christ jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the sea of tiberias and he showed himself in this way gathered there together were simon peter thomas called the twin nathaniel of cana in galilee the sons of zebedee and two others of his disciples simon peter said to him to them I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. By that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. A beach at sunrise or sunset is one of the more beautiful things we can experience. So I've always found this story to be evocative. There's the break of day and the low angle of light. Painters, photographers, and filmmakers often call the hour after sunrise and the hour before sunset the golden hour or magic hour because of the soft quality of light during those times. And as it's just after sunrise, I always imagine this scene in that light. There's the quiet on the beach. Apparently no one has arrived yet. So the disciples and Jesus got to sit at breakfast with the sounds of the waves on the shore, or perhaps maybe birds. There's the joy of a marvelous catch of fish and of seeing Jesus again with St. Peter jumping in the water and swimming to shore fully clothed. There's the smell of charcoal and cooked fish and fresh bread, as well as the taste of those things. It's no surprise that Jesus prepares bread and fish for the disciples here, as it alludes to the two miracles he performed, multiplying loaves and fish for thousands of people. It's also worth noting that when the early church celebrated the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ in bread and wine, it was often accompanied by fish. And of course, the fish is one of the earliest symbols for Christ and the church, as he called his disciples to follow him and learn to fish for people. This text is something of a reaffirmation of that call and more as Jesus once again gives the church peace and direction and calls us to follow him. But the tale begins with some uncertainty. Jesus has already risen and appeared to the apostles in the chapter before this, but it's as though St. Peter and the others are going back to life as usual here. Out of fear, they were hiding behind locked doors until he arrived and spoke peace to them. He gave them instructions. Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So maybe some of their fear was alleviated by seeing Christ again and hearing him offer peace, but it seems they aren't quite sure what to do next. What are the next steps when the Lord rises from the dead, breathes the Holy Spirit on you, and says he is sending you as the Father sent him? Sometimes it feels like something profound has happened in our lives or is happening in our lives, that God has done or is doing a big thing or moving in a big way, but we don't always know what to do in response. We might have a moment of deep peace or beauty when we experience God's presence in a palpable way or feel God calling us to something new. But what are the next steps we're supposed to take? What should we do the next day when that moment has already begun to fade into memory? We are tempted to go back to life as usual. 
but we can't shake the feeling that something ought to change. The disciples followed Jesus for years. They left behind their homes, families, and careers. They accompanied him, saw his miracles, and learned from him. Then he was arrested and crucified, so they scattered. When he was raised from the dead, he came not with retribution for abandoning him, but peace and the promise of a new mission and purpose. But I guess it wasn't all that clear yet what he meant. So these seven disciples returned to Galilee. Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, and two others went back to where they grew up in Galilee and back to where this business with Jesus started for them. Peter resolves to go fishing, the thing he knows best. This isn't just an evening out on the lake, it's a return to the old way of life. He doesn't just return to the home he'd left behind, but the boats and nets and all the ordinary things he used to do. And they have no luck. They catch nothing all night. I wonder if they thought they'd lost their knack for fishing after all that time. Then Jesus calls to them from the shore. They don't recognize him at first. Perhaps there isn't enough light yet, or maybe he simply didn't want them to recognize him yet. But he gives them instructions to cast the net on the right side of their boat, and they catch so many fish they can't haul them in. 153 large fish. Why 153? Talking about that is beside the point here, but it's something we'll look at this Wednesday at Bible study. When this miraculous catch of fish happens, uh, one of them recognizes him. We don't get a name here. The Gospel of John calls him or her the disciple whom Jesus loved. We aren't too sure who this is. Maybe it's St. John or someone else. There are some good hypotheses out there. We will also look at them this Wednesday at 6 p.m. during our Bible study. Let me know if you want to join us. But I don't think the historical identity of this disciple is all that important. Instead, they're probably a stand-in. This is the same disciple to whom Jesus entrusted the care of his mother, the first one to come to faith in the resurrection when he arrived at the empty tomb. He's a stand-in for those of us who believe without seeing, as Jesus put it last week. We are all beloved disciples of the Lord, and we are meant to enter his experience, put ourselves in his shoes when we read the gospel. Like at the empty tomb, we see him recognize Jesus first. He has faith without being able to see everything perfectly. So St. Peter throws on his clothes and swims a hundred yards to shore where Jesus greets the disciples with breakfast. Jesus is once again recognized in the breaking of bread. They were certain this was him. Jesus clearly loved food. We have so many stories about him that involve meals. But also he's once again serving his servants, just as he did before his death, when he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. After breakfast, we get another beautiful scene between Christ and St. Peter, when he asks him three times, do you love me? You'll remember how during Jesus' trial, Peter denied his association with Christ three times, just as Jesus foretold he would, even though Peter claimed he wouldn't. We heard that story on Good Friday. Peter is a little hurt that Jesus asks him three times, and I wonder how long it took him to see the correlation there. So Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? Again, there's some ambiguity here. Is Jesus asking Peter whether he loves him more than he loves the other disciples on the beach with them? Is he asking Peter whether he loves Jesus more than they do, as he claimed at the Last Supper? Another alternative which would be fitting here is, 
Jesus is asking whether Peter loves him more than the boats and nets and the old way of life to which he's returned. This is a question we must ask ourselves. Do we become so attached to the trappings of our everyday lives, our tools, our toys, our livelihood, that we love them more than the Lord? With what would we be willing to part if he asked it of us? Just as he did the first time, Jesus calls Peter to leave these things behind and follow him. In this moment, Peter is reconciled to Jesus. His devotion is reestablished threefold, and he receives nothing but mercy and a new directive. Feed my sheep. Jesus has fed him. St. Peter is nourished physically by the breakfast and spiritually by the Lord's grace. Now Jesus instructs him to tend to those in his care. Feed my sheep. And so it is with us. When we receive grace upon grace from the Lord, we are given a purpose to share with others what we have received. This is not only a matter of wealth and material possessions, it's also one of truth and wisdom, of forgiveness and peace, of the good news of the kingdom of God. These are all things we are told to share, declaring that love has risen from the grave and there is mercy and room at the Lord's table for all. So there are two more related aspects of this text worth talking about this morning. This scene takes place in the morning. We aren't told what morning or which day of the week it is, but there is a hint here of the church gathered in worship. We come to shore on Sunday after a week of toiling at sea, sometimes unfruitfully, and we are greeted by Christ and a meal he has set out for us. That meal is his life-giving presence, offered to us in scripture, in bread and wine, and in our friendship as the people of God. We come together to see him on the shore, to commune with him and one another, to declare our love for him, to offer him our gifts, and to be nourished by him in word and sacrament. Then we are sent with a mission to go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Wherever it is that we end up during the week, whether it's an actual lake or a field, a factory, office, a shop, or even in our own homes, we are sent to share his grace with others. The other aspect is this. This breakfast on the beach in this text can symbolize for us the future heavenly banquet of which all creation will take part. As scripture tells us, a day is coming when God will raise all of us to a new life. Heaven and earth will be transfigured. All things will be made new. It is a time when God's kingdom comes in fullness and God's will is done perfectly on earth and in heaven. The resurrection of Jesus is confirmation of God's pledge to do this. In the words of St. Paul, Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. Or in Colossians, he is the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. In scripture, a symbol for this event, the restoration of all things, is a banquet in which all creatures share in perfect fellowship with God and others, enjoying peace and abundance. St. John's Revelation calls it the wedding feast of the Lamb. The heavenly banquet waiting for us is something in which we mysteriously take part already when we live according to God's will, worship and fellowship together, and share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. This breakfast on the beach with Christ is a symbol of what God has in store for the church and for the whole world. It's no accident that the church has often been represented as a boat throughout history. We are God's fishers in the world, 
casting the net to bring others into a joyful life of peace with God. We are out on the sea of life with all of our daily cares, worries, and hardships, but we will one day reach the shore where we will feast with Christ and our love for him will be brought to perfection. Amen. We will continue with the Apostles' Creed, uh, which is found on 882 in your hymnal. Once you've found it, would you stand if you're able? Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Help us to see anew your image in the child, the stranger, the homeless, and the refugee. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources justly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, spirit, or relationship, all who have suffered loss, and all who are in most need of your peace. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation and bless those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled and we pray that we may share with all of them in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our o Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Native American ministries were taking up a special offering. This is one of six special offerings that the United Methodist Church does each year. And Native American ministries is very um, passionate for me. Um, if you've been to my home, you will notice all of the Native American artifacts. When I was a young child, my parents used to take us up north to the Asabo River and there was a YMCA 
um, down the river where they would have a Potawatomi um, powwow every year. And I was absolutely fascinated with the fire and the dance and the regalia of um, the people. And it was then and there that I have just had this love of Native American history and um, what they're all about. But anyway, this morning, we uh, are served to remind United Methodists of the gifts and the contributions made by Native Americans to our society and in our communities. With more than 20,000 Native Americans within the denomination, this special Sunday helps voice the United Methodist Church. This special Sunday was officially recognized in 1988 and has been celebrated on the third Sunday after Easter since 1989. An offering is taken on this day and is used to develop and strengthen Native American ministries in the annual conferences and Native American rural, urban, reservation ministries and communities. It also provides scholarships for Native Americans attending United Methodist Schools of Theology. Donations support vital ministries and churches in the Native American communities and allow the UMC to partner with existing Native ministries to develop new programs on behalf of the Native Americans. Half of all the donations collected remain within the annual conference to provide hope to children and youth hope for a brighter future in impoverished communities and a voice to those who have felt voiceless for years. This fund is distributed by the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. When you give generously on Native American Ministry Sunday, you equip seminary students who honor and celebrate Native American culture in their ministries. You empower congregations to find fresh and culturally appropriate ways to minister to their communities with Christ's love. Thank you. Turning our hearts toward God in repentance, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful God, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your great love and countless acts of mercy. We are not even worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the Lord who always delights in showing mercy. Feed us then, gracious Lord, with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, in this holy mystery, that we might live as new creatures, grow into his likeness, forever live in him and he in us. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. The body and blood. The blood.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you stand if you're able for the blessing? Friends, go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Let's sing. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.